All right, so we're wrapping up our sermon series on two kingdoms. Today we're going to talk about the kingdom of God and satisfaction, all right? The kingdom of God and satisfaction, or maybe uh, another word we could use is contentment. What does it mean to be content? Um, and, uh, and there's lots to be said here. Uh, there's lots to be said here, and here's why. is because we live in a world that is constantly trying to sell us stuff and things so that it can satisfy us. It makes this promise that, that hey, if you do this, if you sign up for this, if you buy this thing, if you go over over here, you will be satisfied. And yet the Bible says something completely different. And so we're going to take a look at that. We started this journey, uh, this sermon series, this two kingdoms. We started this journey in the book of Genesis. If you were here, you'd remember that. And so um, let's go to Genesis together. Don't worry, guys. Uh, production team, it's, it's not part of the slides. Um, I want to read you something. Because I've been saying, we've been saying, uh, that there are only two kingdoms. Uh, don't believe the lie that, no, 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 there's, there's, there's tons of kingdoms and you can pick whichever one you want. No, no, no. There's only two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. And so the question is, which one are you part of? Yeah. That's the question. If you remember in Genesis, uh, God creates everything uh, and it's beautiful. It's so good. It's so, so good. Um, and, and then he, he tells them to, to rule and to subdue and to be fruitful and multiply. And they're just having such a great time. Uh, and then they decide to do their own thing. Uh, they, they go against God's word. And so they eat of the tree that God told them not to eat of. And it's in that moment that, that uh, the door was opened and sin entered in. The kingdom of darkness came in. And so Adam and Eve then hide, right? They hide. That's their response. That is our response when we are disobedient to God. We hide. And so here's what happens. Genesis chapter 3 verse 9, it says this. So the Lord God called out to man and said to him, where are you? This is after their disobedience. God is the one who initiates the question and he goes, hey, where, where are you? This is a massively important question. Why do you say that, Arne? Well, for two reasons. One is because this, this question is a question of location. That's quite obvious, right? If someone was to ask you, where are you? They're trying to figure out physically, where are you? It is a question of location. You see, God wanted Adam and Eve to recognize that th they were no longer in the kingdom of God. Because of their disobedience, they are now in the kingdom of darkness. So where are you? So it is a question of location, but also it is a question of condition. So not just location, but a question of condition. Where, where are you? Oh, how do you know that? Well, we just keep reading. Verse 10 says this. And he said, this is Adam. I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. I heard you in the garden and so I was afraid, so then I hid. See, the conditions had changed. Up until this point, Adam and Eve would hear God coming in the garden and they would run to him. Like children to their parents, they're just so excited, it's like God is here. But because their location had now changed, their condition had now changed. And so instead of running to him when they hear him coming, now they hide. Don't we do that? It's because there's only two kingdoms. See, in the kingdom of God, we run to him. I mean, we recognize that we are imperfect and in desperate need of a savior, but we run to him. But when we are in the kingdom of darkness, we hide from him. The very same thing with satisfaction. It's the very same thing with satisfaction. And, so, and that's what we're gonna see as we kind of unpack what this means to, to be in the kingdom of God and to be satisfied and to see the lies of this world that are saying, listen, hey, this is how you can be content if you do this, if you buy this, if you're with this person. And I want you to see that this is a lie, that the, the kingdom of darkness only promises lies. It can never deliver on what it promises. Yeah. And so with that, let's jump in. I have a couple of things, I have a couple of things that, that frustrate me. Um, 
and, and the Holy Spirit's working on me, and so uh, please be praying for me. But, but they frustrate me with regards to uh, the Bible and Christians and church, and I even sometimes find myself uh, in these categories. Um, uh, a couple of things. One is when people come and they go, hey, listen, uh, I feel a certain way about something that God has said. And I totally get that. Like, your feelings are valid. I say this all the time, right? Feelings are great. They help us navigate through life, but they're horrible saviors. And so when people come and go, you know, I feel, I feel that, that what you guys are doing or your particular stance on something, uh, I just feel that it's wrong. And I'm like, man, I'm all in. That's great. Let's grab a coffee. Let's sit down. Let's talk about it. Okay, I want to hear your feelings. And then I also want to go, and so then where do you get that from? And then, and then the response is just, no, I just feel that way. I go, well, yeah, I feel a lot of things as well. But at some point, your feelings have got to submit to the word of God. If you are a Christian, your feelings have got to submit to the gospel. So that's one thing that frustrates me. But here's another one, and I talk about this all the time. I, I, I cannot stand, I cannot stand smash and grab kind of uh, uh, sermons and teachings and, and preachings. You, you know what that is, smash and grab? It's where we go to the Bible, smash it open, grab a verse, and then just go, yes, this is what it means, and now I'm gonna live in light of that. When, when that verse is completely out of context. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. What, what's, what's a few that some of you guys know? Jeremiah. Oh, Jer Jeremiah. What's, how do, what's, what's the Jeremiah one? What's the Jeremiah one? I know the plans that I have for you. It's on every single vision board, right? And you got all the things around it. And then you look at the vision board and you're like, yeah, I, I don't think you read the entire context. It's crazy. Where two or more are gathered. Huh? I, I mean, it's true. Where two or more are gathered, yes, there, there he is. But if you're using that to go, I don't have to be a part of a church. Because where two or more are gathered, it's me and my friend Tabo. I'm hoping there isn't a table here. <laughs> Completely out of context. But here's another one. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I love that one. Uh, so out of context. I mean, like, for firstly, so many prosperity preachers use it to, to, to gain all these things, right? Failing to recognize that the person that wrote it, wrote it from prison. Yes. And so if what you're preaching, and then you go, hey, but Paul, clearly you, you didn't understand what you were writing. Like it just doesn't make sense. That's, it's because it's, it's completely out of context. And so what, what do we do? To understand the text, we must understand the context. And so Philippians 4.13 is where people get it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Um, but we should read uh, a little bit before and a little bit often. Here's what Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. He says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly because once again you renewed your care for me. You were, in fact, concerned about me but lacked the opportunity to show it. Yeah. I don't say this out of need, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. I know how to make do with little. And I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content. And here I am to tell you what the secret is. The secret is Jesus. Okay, go ahead and tell you. There's no, there's, there, there we go, it's Jesus, okay? I, I have learned the secret of being content. Whether well-fed, amen, amen, or hungry, yeah. amen. amen. The second one wasn't as strong as the first one, but <laughs> let's try again. Whether in abundance, amen, amen. or in need, amen. amen. There we go. Then he says, I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. So he says, in, in light of all of that, in light of Jesus, I can do all things. Whether I'm living the good life and I have everything that I need, or whether I'm going, man, I, it's tough. It is tough. But you know what? I've learned the secret. I've learned the secret of being content. That's where it comes from. And it's important for us to, to know that as we're about to talk about the kingdom of God and satisfaction. Because the secret is Jesus. 
And you might go, oh, okay, great, Honor, you've told us, now we can go home. You can, uh, but you all dressed up and drove from very far to be here, and so we'll keep going. Okay, let's unpack what this means. Because I said it to you before, this world, this kingdom of darkness is doing everything it can to make you believe that you don't need Jesus to be satisfied. In fact, it's built, it's, it's built a, a, and I, I'm gonna use the word trillion, I don't use that word a lot, but a trillion, a trillion, and then I'm not just gonna say rand, because then that's obvious, a trillion dollar industry in trying to sell you things to say, if you buy this, do this, go here, then you will be satisfied. And so let's take a look at, at what King Solomon has to say, because he has some words on satisfaction and being content. He, he has some things to share with us. And so we're gonna look at two chapters. We're gonna move quite quickly. Ecclesiastes chapter one. Here's what Solomon has to say about, about being satisfied, about finding contentment. He says, Verse one, the, the words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. So this is, this is Solomon. He says, verse two, absolute futility, says the teacher. Now other translations say vanity. Vanity, absolute vanity. He says it again, absolute futility. Everything is futile. Uh, here's another word for, for futility. It's, it's fruitless, it's pointless, it's useless, it's worthless, it's empty. That's what he's saying. That's how he starts. Tell us more, Solomon. Verse three says, what, what does a person gain for all his efforts that he labors under the sun? He's telling us that, that we live in a, in a world where, where you work, but you don't ultimately get what you worked for. Yeah, yeah. Let's be honest. Too many things cost too much that require more and more work. It's like you complete a task, but then there's more to do. That's the reality. You, you, you tick off and you go, I've done it, and then you turn around and it's like, wow, there's more to do. Verse four, a generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets. Panting, it hurries back to the place where it rises, gusting to the south, turning to the north, turning, turning goes the wind, and the wind returns in its cycles. All the streams flow to the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place where the streams flow, they flow again. He, he now looks at the cycles of the earth, and he says, you know what? You know what I observe? They just keep going again and again and again and again. It's like they're on repeat. We, we get summer, autumn, winter, spring. Summer, autumn, and that is the correct order, is that right? It's summer, autumn, winter, spring? Yes. Yeah. Some of y'all are thinking, is it, is it really? Okay, great. Summer, autumn, winter, spring. Over and over and over again. And isn't it interesting, we find ourselves saying the same thing in every season. Gosh, it's too hot. <laughs> then winter shows up. Yo, guys, it's cold. <laughs> like, like, it's like we're robots. I know exactly what you're gonna say come September. Oh, I'm so tired. <laughs> when can Christmas come? Like, I know, I know. I know what you're gonna say 2025 in January. I got New Year's resolutions, I got goals, I'm so excited. It's the same over and over and over again. Verse eight, he says, all, all things are wearisome, more than any other can say. The, the eye is not satisfied by seeing or the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and, and what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. C can one say about anything, look, this is new? It has already existed in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of those who came before and of those who will come after. There will always be no remembrance by those who follow them. Solomon says here, he says, our, our eyes can never really see enough. That's what he's saying. This is, this is why if you look at the stats, there's just an, an ever increasing of, of, of our screen times. But let's be honest, it's like we're looking at the same stuff. The, the advancement of technology is, is feeding the same appetites. 
So what's really new? I mean, let's be honest, what's, what's really new? And, and Solomon, I mean, S- Solomon had it all. Not only was he the, the wisest man to have ever lived, we're told that he was the richest man to have ever lived. He had it all. He, he had the best food, the best houses, the best clothes, the best everything. He had the latest everything. But in the end, he sees it all as pointless. That's what he's saying. It's all useless. Verse 12. I, the teacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. He's now now really coming into our neighborhoods. In fact, he's in many of our houses. Solomon is about to put his feet up on your coffee tables. Okay, so I'm just prepping you. It's about to get seriously uncomfortable, but you've been warned. I, the teacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. I applied my mind to examine and explore through wisdom all that is done under heaven. So all you PhD people out there, Solomon's gone, I've got got them all. I've got them all. And I've cum laude all of them. So those late nights that you've, I've, I've done it, I know it. God has given people this miserable task to keep them occupied. It's the word word of God. I I have seen all the things that are done under the sun and have found everything to be futile. A a pursuit of the wind. Anyone ever try to catch the wind? You you have? Praise praise God. How did it go? Did you catch it? Did Did you? Some of it. Some of it. Verse 15, what is crooked cannot be straightened and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, see, I have amassed wisdom far beyond all those who were over Jerusalem before me and my mind has thoroughly grasped wisdom and knowledge. I applied my mind to know wisdom and knowledge, madness and folly. I learned that this too is a pursuit of the wind. The more he learned, the emptier he felt. That's what he's saying. For with much wisdom is much sorrow. As knowledge increases, grief increases. Here's why. See, knowledge knowledge in itself can never fulfill us. It just can't. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't study. I'm not saying that you shouldn't get your master's and your PhDs. By all means, please, please, more and more and more. We do need to make sure that we keep it equal. Um, the, the doctors who can save our lives and then the doctors who can point us to really good books. We need to keep that at an equilibrium um, here at Rooted, please. But I'm not saying you shouldn't study. And, and, the, and the Bible's not saying, that, like, it, we should study. But you should recognize that it will not fulfill you. Yeah. Why? Because, because, because knowledge in of itself, it's, it's insatiable. It's impossible to satisfy. Therefore, its its increase of it only heightens our uh, awareness of our own ignorance. That's what's happening. See, Solomon went, he went on a search to determine if wisdom could answer all of life's big questions. This is what he did. He he collected, he collected from, from all the corners of the world, he just got knowledge and everything. He just got it from everywhere. And what he discovered was that the more he learned, the more devastated he became. And that's because the more you learn, the more you are responsible for. That's why. And so he's consuming all this knowledge and he's going, oh my goodness, I, I can't play the ignorance card anymore. I am now, resp- in some shape or form, I am now responsible This made Solomon even more cynical. Increasing his thesis, you see what I did there? His thesis on life being pointless. Oh, but he continues. Chapter two. I said to myself, go ahead, I will test you with pleasure 
Enjoy what is good. So he's going, okay, if, if knowledge is not going to help me, if the PhDs are not going to help me, then, then, then let me turn to pleasure. Can pleasure satisfy me? But it turned out to be futile. Yeah. I said about laughter, it, it is madness. And about pleasure, what does it accomplish? I explored with my mind the pull of wine on my body, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. He became a connoisseur of fine wine. And not just of fine wine, but of fine things. And, and how to grasp folly until I could see what is good for people to do under heaven during the few days of their lives. Underline that word if you're taking notes, the few, few. In light of eternity, 80 years means nothing. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't live life. I'm saying the only way to live life is in Christ. But you need to recognize that while I'm here on earth, how, Lord, how can I maximize for your glory these, these, these few days? Because in light of eternity, these are, these are just a few days. V verse 4, he says, I, I increased my achievements. So now he's transitioned. He's gone, okay, pleasure is not, is not working, clearly. It's pointless. So I, I increased my achievements. I, I built houses. So Solomon had housing projects. And again, the wealthiest man to have ever lived. I'm not talking about like a complex or an estate. No, 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 no. This man was building cities. He had housing projects and planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself and planted every kind of fruit tree in them. So not only did he have housing projects, but he had gardening and agricultural projects. I constructed reservoirs for myself from which to irrigate a grove of, uh, of flourishing trees. So not only housing projects, not only gardening and agricultural products, but he, but he had water projects as well. Which means that if you were a tenderpreneur back in those days, uh, you would have wanted to be good friends with Solomon. Yeah. I mean, you wanted to hang with him because he, he, he had it all. And yet, even that just... Just didn't really satisfy. Verse 7, I, I acquired male and female servants and had slaves who were born in my house. Uh-oh. Wait, he did what? Triggering. Right? Like some of us, we, we read that and then, and then we, we make the conclusion that it's like, well, you see on there, I knew it. I knew it. God condones slavery. And I go, uh, no, no, he doesn't. So let, so let me clear this up. God hates slavery. He hates it. And, and here's how we know. Exodus 22, verse 21 to 24. Deuteronomy 24, verse 14. Proverbs 14, verse 31. Clearly, clearly God says, listen, I am against this kind of, this kind of thing that you're doing. This, this, this slavery, I, I hate it. The Bible does not condone slavery. You see, Every time you read, and I, and I know it's in there in your Bibles, every time you read slavery, sometimes you've, you've got to put on your, 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 your interpreting lenses and you've got to ask the question, what's going on here? Because back then, they, they had this practice, it was kind of economical, this practice where if I was doing business with Elder Kenny and, and, and then I ran out of money, I would hope that he would forgive me and be like, it's totally cool, because of Christ, you're free. But this Old Testament, so... I would enter into a relationship with him where I'd go, you know what, I, I don't have any money. I've, I've gone bankrupt. Things aren't going good for me. And then I would work for him. So maybe the, the right word here is a, a bond servant, right? I would, I would enter into this until that debt is paid or, or until a, a time has lapsed where it's like now I can go free. Yeah. This was to lead to the flourishing of the people. You can go read all about it in the Old Testament. Now, I say this also recognizing that slavery did exist. In fact, we see this in Exodus with the Egyptians and the Israelites, which is very similar to the kind of slavery that we know about today. And, 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 and sadly, and it's, just, it's horrible that it still continues in certain parts of the world. God hates that. I need you to hear me on this. God hates that. 
And so even though there, there, there was clarity given on, on how you are to navigate this, 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 this complex life that we live in where it's like, well, I gotta do business, I've gotta conduct business, and, and sometimes I run into some tough times where, where I've gotta enter into this kind of economic relationship. Because of sin, we know that some people just take that a little bit too far. They take it a little bit too far. And, and still there is a response to that with the gospel. We're gonna see this in the second part of this year as we walk through the book of Philemon or Philemon. But I promised you by the time we get there, we'll know how to pronounce it and regardless of what school you went to. Okay, so, 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 so there is a gospel response. But, and so as we read this, we could go, no, th this is what he's referring to. So Solomon's talking about kind of this, this, this economic relationship and, and some people have fallen on some hard times. And, and so instead of going, you know what, uh, good luck, you're on your own, which is kind of the world that we live in is so individualistic. It's like, oh, not my problem. He goes, no, 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 let's, let's figure out a plan. Let's figure out a plan that leads to not just health, but flourishing. So that's possible. And yet at the same time, Solomon was just like us. Yes, the wisest man to have ever lived and the wealthiest man to have ever lived, but still a man. Yeah. And, and so who knows, maybe as he's acquiring all these things, greed steps in and he's going, you know what, maybe I can, I can take it a little bit further. I can cross the line. And before we judge, how many of us cross the line? Yeah. Before we judge, how many of us cross the line? We, we, we live in a world today where, you know, it's like you did what? Canceled. How could you? What? Canceled. Friends, you cannot be a Christian. You cannot be a Christian and amen cancel culture. Yeah. Yes. I know I'm stepping on some toes here, but hear me out. I am against, I am against some of the most, not some, all, all of the, the horrific things that happen in our world. And I believe in justice. In in this life and definitely the next. It's the gospel. But as a Christian, I cannot. I cannot sign up to cancel culture. As a Christian, the, the, the only canceling we should amen is when the blood of Jesus cancels the sin of humanity. And so that means until you breathe your last breath, you are worthy to be saved that the gospel can still apply to you. And because that is true, hear me, we're gonna get to heaven and we're gonna be blown away by some of the people that are there. Where, where today we went, there's no, no ways, canceled. There's no ways. You are beyond the grace of God. How dare we say that? And so we're gonna be, we're gonna be shocked at who's in heaven. And at the same time, we're gonna be shocked at who's not there. Because there are people here masquerading, performing and pretending. They have not surrendered their lives to Jesus. And so they know what to do and when to do it, but their hearts are disconnected from the Father. I also owned livestock, large herds, flocks, more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. I amassed silver and gold for myself and, and the treasure of kings and provinces. I, I gathered male and female singers for myself. You see, back then, uh, music w w was a very rare pleasure to have at a large scale. I mean, you could play music in your own home by yourself, but, but, but to, to have performances was very rare, very rare for a number of reasons. And yet Solomon goes, you know what? I had bands and choirs in my house. I had it all. And many concubines, the delights of men. Again, uh, I think Solomon would have benefited tremendously from uh, the kingdom of God in sex. The Bible tells us he had, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. I, I, just, I didn't even know what to do with that. I don't know. But what I do know is that he was in direct violation of God's law. And because of that, there were, there were so many consequences for it. That is still true today. So I, I became great 
and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. My, my wisdom also remained with me. Verse 10, all, all that my eyes desired, I did not deny them. Sure. Let me read that again. All that my eyes desired, I did not deny them. I did not refuse myself any pleasure, for I took pleasure in all my struggles. Huh. This was my reward for all my struggles. So be careful. You might think, yes, and then you read the very next line and go, oh, okay, there's consequences to that. When I considered all that I had accomplished and what I had labored to achieve, I found everything to be futile and, and the pursuit of the wind. There was nothing to be gained under the sun. So Solomon says, pursuing happiness, meaning, and purpose through wealth is, is pointless. It's vanity. It's useless. Verse 12, then I turned to consider wisdom, madness, and folly for what will the king's successor be like? He will do what has already been done. He'll just repeat what I did. So, so he's going, you know what, man, this, you know, this is, maybe I can just hand it over to the next generation. And then he goes, well, actually, they're just going to do what I did. And I realized that there is an advantage to wisdom over folly, like an advantage of light over darkness. So he's like, okay, hold on, hold on. I know it sounds heavy, but there is an advantage here. The wise person has eyes in his head. Well, I hope all of us have eyes in our head. But the fool walks in darkness. Yet I also knew that one fate comes to both of them. He's about to tell us that he says, look, maybe the only value for wisdom might be that you are better prepared for death because the reality is that all of us are going to die. All of us. You know what the statistic is for, for death in South Africa? So it's 100%, okay, it's 100%. Like we're all gonna die. And so he's going, maybe, maybe I can use wisdom to, just to better prepare for that, just to, just to be like, you know, I'm aware that this is going to happen. Maybe I can get a funeral plan, you know? Maybe I can try to put some money aside for, for those who come after me, but <laughs> listen to what he says. So I said to myself, what happens to the fool will also happen to me. Why then have I become overly wise? And I said to myself that this is also futile. For, for just like the fool, there is no lasting remembrance of the wise. Since in the days to come, both will be forgotten. You know what, guys? Let me tell you something. I know all of us tend to think we're going to be the next Mark Zuckerberg and um, Elon Musk and who else is amazing? Uh, uh, J.R. Tolkien. And, um, <laughs> that's great if that's you. Praise God. But for most of us, our, our grandkids won't really even know who we are. Our great-grandkids, for sure, will just be pictures. And pictures that they don't even want to look at. I mean, if you've got kids, you know what I'm talking about. It's like, come and take a look at when you were... I couldn't care less. I just want to go ride my scooter outside. I mean, like, like that's... And you're thinking to yourself, man, you have no idea how important this person was to me. And they're like, I don't care. I don't care. I want to go play. So good luck on that. How is it that the wise person dies just like the fool? Therefore, I hated life because of the work that was done under the sun was distressing to me. For everything is futile in a pursuit of the wind. I, I hated all my work that I labored at under the sun because I must leave it to the one who comes after me. So I think what Solomon does is he goes, you know what? I'm looking at my kids. And then I'm looking at everything that I've built. And then I'm looking at my kids again. And I'm like, I, I don't know. I, I, maybe I need to write in like, like extensively, this is what you do with this, this is what you do with this. And I still feel like even with that, some of our kids are going to throw it away. You know, the only thing that we can take to heaven is people. That's the only thing that we can take to heaven is people. Some of you wonder why, why is Oner always on mission, mission. We need to reach more. You're one more. Let's plant churches. It's because we can only take people to heaven. And yet so many of us, again, I'm not, I'm, I'm not anti-stuff. I'm not. But it's when you are looking for life and meaning and purpose in those things. You, you're going to have someone, I mean, it's already happening now. You know, it's like, oh, you know, I, I don't have enough stuff. No. If you cannot find enough hangers in your house, you have way too much stuff. 
If it's, if it's come laundry day or ironing day or whatever, and you're like, where are the hangers? I don't have enough hangers. You've got too much stuff. Just go ahead and tell you. And so what do you do with that stuff? Well, some of us, we, we, we pay money to store that stuff in places, and we will never use that stuff. You know what? Stop doing that. Just add that money, that rental, uh, to the commitment card to our two-year <laughs> discipleship journey on generosity. I'm telling you, it's good. It's going gonna, it's gonna to do way more, way more than that storage space. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. He's like, I have no idea. We do the best we can. But who knows? Yet he will take over all my work that I labored at skillfully under the sun. This too is futile. So I began to give myself over to despair. He's so frustrated. Like he's just, he's, he's, he's just thinking to himself, this is, this is, so, this is so frustrating. I began to give myself over to despair concerning all my work that I had labored at under the sun. Where, when there is a person whose work was done with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and he must give his portion to a person who has not worked for it, this too is futile and a great wrong. We're called to work. We're called to work. We, we covered this in the kingdom of God and work. It's, it's part of our cultural mandate. And so when you go, I just, like I'm all for legacy and I'm all for inheritance. The Bible speaks of it. But, but, but we're supposed to hand that over and we're to say, listen, now you carry on with this cultural mandate that has been given to us. It's the greatest thing that you can hand over. The greatest being the gospel, but the implication of the gospel. For what does a person get with all his work and all his efforts that he labors under the sun? For all these days are filled with grief and this occupation is sorrowful. Even at night, his mind does not rest. This too is futile. So here's, here's, King, here's King Solomon's conclusion. Verse 24 to 26, he, he says this, there is nothing better for a person, there is nothing better for a person than to eat, drink, and enjoy his work. I've seen that even this is from God's hand because who can eat or who can enjoy life apart from him? That's the point. That's the point. Yeah, yeah, we should enjoy life, but, but you, you cannot enjoy it apart from him. For to the person who is pleasing in his sight, he gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and accumulating in order to give to the one who is pleasing in God's sight. This too is futile and a pursuit of the wind. Man, it's like we read this and it's, we go, sounds like Solomon needs to see a counselor. Right? Like, let's be honest. But if we say that, then, then, then here's the next thing we need to recognize. Sounds like we need to see a counselor. Because yeah. I hear many of us say this, and we cover it up with pretending and performing, but, but when we get to the core of it, it's, it's like, I'm just not satisfied with life. I'm just not content. I, I want more. Something's missing. Yeah. And so, look, here, here's, here's the point. Here's the point, and I'll be out your way. We were designed by God to have a natural desire I mean, let's, let's, let's take food and water, okay? Basic, basic needs. We, we were designed by God to have a natural desire for food and water. These are two massive needs that all of us need. We, we must have to, to, to be satisfied, to have life, food and water. And, and hear this, neither is a result of the fall. Right? I need you to hear that. Ne neither is a result of the fall. However, there was a change when sin entered the world in relation to our hunger and our thirst. And that change was the attempt to satisfy our, our created hungering and thirsting with the wrong things. And such attempts continue today as the kingdom of darkness seeks to, to lure us further and further away from God. See, when God made us in his image and breathed the breath of life into our lungs... He, he, he designed us to find genuine joy, inner peace, and satisfaction in only one place. Yeah. And that's with him. Yeah. And that's with him. Amen. Why? Because he is the creator and the sustainer of all things. Where else are you going to go to find genuine joy and inner peace and satisfaction? In fact, the, the great African... Uh, 
church father, St. Augustine, says this. He says, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. So good. You see, this, this restlessness, this restlessness that he speaks of, you need to know that it's a divine gift. Now, now I know it, it may come across weird. It's like, no, but should we be restless? No, no, this one, this one here, it is a divine gift from God. It, you see, it is, this, this restlessness is, is, is that desire to be, to be not only filled, but fulfilled. To be filled and fulfilled. And hear me, we all have it. We all have this restlessness. There is this massive hole in us. Each and every one of us, have, we have this massive hole in us, and it is a God-sized hole. And only God, only God can fill it and fulfill it. This is why Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, chapter three, verse 11, he says, he has also put eternity in our hearts. He's put eternity. Do you know why you feel like, ah, oh, whatever I'm doing just doesn't feel, does it, what's well, because it's temporary. It's temporary. God has put eternity in our hearts. We were made for more. And that's why we are restless. Even though sin came into our lives and, and made us try and foolish things to fill our deepest hunger and thirst outside of God, and it, it really tries. The kingdom of God really tries. You're gonna leave from this place going, you know, what a great sermon. You're gonna get in your car, you're gonna drive down the road and, and already the kingdom of darkness is at your ear. Wanna be satisfied? <laughs> Why don't you pull over to this place? And then you'll get home, you'll be like, no! Resist the devil. You get home and then you'll open up your laptop. You're like, I'm going to work. And then this notification comes in. Want to be satisfied? Just buy this on take a lot. In fact, you'll get it tomorrow. <laughs> the, the kingdom of, world, of darkness will do everything, everything but God. Oh, two of my favorite words in the Bible. But God, being a good God, being a loving God, being a merciful God, has, has graciously made a way for us to be satisfied again. That we can cure this restlessness. And, and he, he did this in and through and by His Son, Jesus Christ. Look, look friends, there, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, there, there are... Uh, seven great I am statements that Jesus makes, right? Um, in the book of John, he says, I am the light, I am the door, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection and the life, I am the way and the truth and the life, I am the true vine. And then in, in John chapter six, verse 35, there's another I am, he says this, I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry and no one who ever believes in me will ever be thirsty again. What a statement, to our God-sized holes. Like, what a statement. I am the bread of life. And, and for my, my Bible nerds out there, there's no coincidence that, that, that Jesus was born in Bethlehem and, and the Hebrew word for Bethlehem is, is the house of bread. No coincidence. And then in, in the gospel, according to John, right out the gates, John tells us that the word became flesh. He's talking about Jesus. Then later on, Jesus says, this is my body, broken. The same way that bread is broken. This is my body, take and eat. There's no coincidence either. Yeah. Why? Because this has always been the very plan of God. Yeah. Fr from the moment Adam and Eve disobeyed and, and, and the kingdom of darkness entered in and, and they turned their backs on God, God went, I'm gonna go on a rescue mission for you. Because there's nothing, and all that I have created, there is nothing that will satisfy you except me. Jesus is the bread of life to satisfy our hunger so that we might be content. Jesus is also living water. John chapter 4, some of you might know of this story. It's his encounter, Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well. Where, where Jesus asked her for a drink of water. 
She, she responds, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? She asked him, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God, if you knew the gift of God, someone in here, if you knew the gift of God, and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him if he would give you living water. What's he saying? Well, he's telling us that, that he alone, this is Jesus, that he alone can quench all our thirsts in this world. That's what he's saying. All our thirsts, companionship, meaning, purpose, direction, rest, all of it, he can quench it. And so this begs the question, is this you? Is this you? Is this how you experience Jesus? You say you walk with Jesus. You say that you're a Christian. And so is, is, he, is he satisfying you? Right now in this very moment, is he, is he satisfying you? Or is it an opportunity for you to evaluate your own life? Search me, O oh Lord. Am I running to other things, hoping to find life and meaning and companionship? And then I go, why am I not satisfied? And instead of turning to Jesus, we continue down the rabbit hole. Is Jesus the nourishment of your soul? Are we drawing deeply from the well of his satisfying love that never runs dry? The point is this, friends. Apart from Jesus, nothing satisfies. Nothing. Apart from Jesus, your marriage, apart from Jesus, will not satisfy. Your kids, apart from Jesus, will not satisfy. Your work, apart from Jesus, will not satisfy. Your friendships, apart from Jesus, will not satisfy. Your hobbies, apart from Jesus, will not satisfy. Your goals, your ambitions, your vision, apart from Jesus, will not satisfy. We are designed to find satisfaction in God alone. And through His great mercy, He invites us to discover that He is enough to satisfy all our desires, every desire of the soul. And so if you desire for this eternal whole, this God-sized whole, if you desire for it to be filled and fulfilled, then you must obey the words of Jesus where He says two things. In verse 35, we must obey this. Firstly, we must come to him. That's the first step. If you're sitting and you're going, I want to be filled and fulfilled by God. I want to be satisfied by him. Then, then you must come to him. He says, yeah, no one who comes to me will ever be hungry. Come to Jesus. The invitation has been sent. It's sitting in the inbox of your life. Are you just going to look at it or are you going to click open and go, okay, Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. I find it fascinating that people will be like, no, I want to be satisfied in Christ, but then you don't go to him. Come to Jesus. This is both the Christian and the non-Christian, the one who believes and the one who doesn't believe. You see, for the non-Christian, you need to come to Jesus for eternal life. You need the gospel. Come to Jesus for eternal life. And then for the Christian, for the Christian, here's how it looks. Let me say it this way. Let me turn it around. See, the most miserable of Christians, those experiencing discontentment, dissatisfaction, and a lack of the soul to find rest, are the ones trying to be satisfied in the sinful pleasures or even the normal pleasures. So don't just think sinful, even the normal pleasures of this world. That you're trying to find fulfillment in those. The problem is this. You are trying to have Jesus and the world together. That's the problem. Why am I not satisfied? Well, think about it for a moment. Are you trying to make Jesus a part-time lover? Are you trying to make Jesus a friend with benefits? Jesus doesn't do open relationships. Now, hear me, I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not saying deny your hunger. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying don't try to fill it with the, the candy floss delights of this world. Bring your hunger to Jesus. Stop. So we, we live close to the Grove Mall, and they've just placed this, this candy floss making machine, like right there where the kids play. It's strategically placed. And, uh, and every time I go there, I'll, I'll find these little kids, like literally their nose up against the glass, looking at this, this machine that makes candy floss, 
right? Because it's so inviting, all these colors and it's spinning and it's great. And they're just like, they're drooling. And they're like, wow, this is amazing. And I'm just like the Grove Mall. What on earth is wrong with you? Kingdom of darkness. And, and like, and, and, they, and they're looking at it, they're, they're just so desired and they want it. And they look at their parents and they've got that look of like, oh, Papa, please, Mama, I want to have a candy. You know what I mean? And so the parents are taking out money and, and then they're consuming. Anyone ever had candy floss? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's trash. It's absolute trash. Zero nutritional value. Like zero. And, and, and like you eat it and, and it's just, I mean, it's just sugar. And so I'm looking at these kids eating it, and I'm like, wow, you're going to have a fun time later today, because the kids are going to be bouncing off the walls, and, and then they're just going to crash, and then that's it. And I look at these kids, and I go, that's me. That's me. So, so run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. And then secondly, uh, I'm going to call the band up, and we'll close out here. Uh, secondly, we must believe. So, so not only do we come to Jesus, but we must believe. Look what Jesus says. He says, no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. And this is not, it's not a belief of acknowledgement. Hear me, it's not a belief of acknowledgement. We live in a context where I, I think a lot of people go, no, I believe. It's a belief of acknowledgement. I acknowledge that, yes, there is a story about a person called Jesus. And he was the, the son of man. Yeah, I've heard those things and I've heard the stories performed many miracles. No, I acknowledge that, totally. And so I tick on the form, Christian. No, this, this is not a belief of acknowledgement. It's one of total dependence. See, the word believes in the Greek is, is pisteo, which, which means to trust and then hear this and entrust. It's to trust and entrust. So I trust that Jesus is who he says he is and I entrust my life to him. Yes. Those are two things happening there. It's one thing to be in the car and to be like, no, 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 yeah, I believe. I believe that uh, Jesus is the son of God, 100%. It's a whole other thing to get out of the driving seat and go, Jesus, I need you to take the wheel yeah. in every aspect of my life. Yes. And when Jesus turns a corner and you go, hey, where, where, we, where, we, where are we going? Where are we, Jesus, where are we going? Jesus is not afraid of your questions. But to say, you know what, continue. My life is in your hands. We must believe. So come to Jesus. Draw near to God and, and, and through Jesus, God will draw near to you. Come and believe. Take Jesus at his word. Put your life in his hands. Then, and only then, will your soul be satisfied. Friends, we're going to respond in a moment. Because it's one thing to preach about this, it's a whole other thing to respond to it. But before we do, I, just, I want us to, to make sure that we, we marvel at the, at the love of Christ. We should be in awe at the love of Christ. Because it's this love that invites us to come to Him and to believe in Him, promising satisfaction for spiritual hunger and quenching for eternal thirst. And, and these, these things become ours through faith, not, not through emotions, not, not even through sight, no. But through faith in Jesus, it's trusting, it's trusting and believing that he is who he says he is and has completed what he came to accomplish. And so my question to you before we sing is do you wanna be satisfied? Do you want to be satisfied? We're going to sing a song now, and it's, a, it's an oldie, depending on how long you've been walking with Jesus. It's called Hungry. Hungry, I, I, I'm falling on my knees. Hungry. And, and, and I, I think sometimes, you know, especially for a church like ours, when we think hungry, we think, oh, you know what, I'm really, I'm list for a burger. No. I believe the... The author of the song, when he, when, he, when he penned these words, he was going, you know what? I, I see all the delights of the world. And because I know they cannot satisfy, I will not try them. And yet I find myself in this, in this dry and weary place. 
And so I am hungry. But I am hungry for the Lord. Because I know only He will satisfy. I am thirsty for the Lord because only He can quench that thirst. And so I believe for us to get there, you've got to start with saying, Lord, would you show me my need? And you have no idea how scary that is. God, would you show me how needy I am? And for some of us, it might be so overwhelming that maybe your prayer is, God, would you show me how needy I am, but in bite sizes? Because I don't know if I'll be able to, to, to I'll be contained, I'll be so overwhelmed at how, how desperate I am in need of you. But would you show me enough that I might be able to come to you and believe? And then would you continue to show that to me as I journey with you? And so we're going to sing. And if that's you, and you recognize that, man, I just, I need, I need Jesus. As we sing, it's an opportunity for you. Like we put out these cushions and there's more over there. And, and, and I said it a couple of weeks ago, use the prayer corner, but use the frontier. Just come. Sometimes our body needs to, to take that step so that our heart can follow. There's so many times in our lives where you're like, I want to do it, I want to do it, but and then you leave this place having never come to Jesus, having never met with him, having never like, you know what, God, I need you. And so you come grab these cushions, you get on your knees. Why do we get on our knees? It's, a, it's, it's our way of surrendering. It's our way of surrendering. When Jesus returns, all of us are going to bow and all of us are going to confess. All of us. The question is, are you bowing in awe and wonder because you're blown away by His great mercy and what He's done for you and you confess that He is your Lord and Savior? Or are you bowing because it's too late and you recognize this is a holy king? Holy king and I am unholy and unrighteous. And so come to him and believe in him. And so Father God, I pray for each and every one of us this morning that we would recognize that we are in desperate need of a savior and his name is Jesus. Jesus, you came to live the life that we should have lived, died the death that we deserve. You rose from the grave. You are now seated at the right hand of the Father. And you know what? You continue to pray for us. You cry out our names and you say, come, come to me. All who are weary, come to me. All who are hungry, come to me. All who are thirsty, come to me. And when we just fall on our knees, in awe of you and in worship because only you satisfy and sometimes we just have to wait we just have to wait you, you'll have us wait on our knees just because we can get so distracted by the things of this world and so for those of us who just need to wait and so we wait and so we wait and so we wait, and so we wait, crying out that we are hungry, and would you satisfy us, and Holy Spirit, meet every single one of us where we are. We love you. We need you. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen.